About 45 years ago, a group of Cub Scouts from the 1st Wallace Scout Group visited the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon in North London. As you can imagine, it was all rather splendid, especially to an impressionable nine-year-old me. But there was one exhibit in particular that really caught my eye. An enormous biplane flying boat, so tall that it appeared to be holding the hangar roof up. The older me knows that it was, and still is, a Vickers Supermarine Stranraer flying boat, the only intact survivor of its class. The little me just thought it was magnificent. All those bracing wires. The Stranra, largest and last of the RAF biplane flying boats, first flew in 1934. Powered by two Bristol Pegasus engines, a total of 24 were built in Great Britain. In the late 1930s, a further 40 boats were constructed at the Canadian Vickers plant in Montreal, Quebec. On the 10th of June 1940, Canada declared war on Italy. Later the same day, the Italian merchant ship Capo Nola was intercepted in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Squadron leader Leonard Burchill flew a dummy attack in his Stranra flying boat. True to form, the Italians surrendered, running the ship aground on a sandbank. By 1944, Stranra's were being released from military service. Five were purchased by Queen Charlotte Airlines, who operated services from Vancouver and along the coast of British Columbia. Queen Charlotte Airlines had the nickname Queer Collection of Aircraft due to its rather varied and eclectic fleet. By 1950, three of the Stranra's had been lost in accidents. The remaining two were re-engined with Wright Cyclones and fitted with Hamilton standard constant speed propellers, thus becoming Super Stranras. In 1958, the one surviving aircraft was sold to Stranra Aerial Enterprises of Richmond, Vancouver. The boat was in poor condition by then, so it was dismantled in Vancouver and towed on its beaching gear to Abbotsford in British Columbia for rebuild. Rather than again dismantle and tow the aircraft back to Vancouver, it was decided to fly it off a dolly at Abbotsford Airport. There was quite a crosswind, but the takeoff was perfect, the dolly staying on the runway as the aircraft climbed away. In the next four years, the aircraft flew nearly 500 hours, operating charter flights throughout British Columbia, but by 1966 it was all over. The Stranraer sat at Vancouver Airport, becoming increasingly derelict, until sold to the RAF Museum in 1970. It was flown back to the United Kingdom in a pair of short Belfasts of Transport Command. Fortunately for us, in 1966, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation made a 25-minute film about the Stranra. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome again to Klahani, the great outdoors. Oh, if you're 20 years of age or younger, the chances are you've never even heard of a strong rare flying boat, let alone seen one of the wonderful old birds. And actually, we should call this one a wonderful and a rare old bird, because this is the last strong rare or strani remaining in the world. This particular one, it is a Vickers Supermarine strong rare 20 passenger flying boat. It was built in Montreal in 1936. And this one, probably foot for foot, is the most expensive flying boat ever built. Because when Vickers put this together, they wanted it to last forever. And this Stranraer and others like her probably did more to open up the BC coast than any other single transportation device.
other day, we got in touch with Jim Lightbound, who for the past seven years has been custodian of this last Stranny, and he's lavished it with all his tender, loving care. We collected a couple of pilots who used to fly the Stranny, Hugh Mann and Stu Phillips, and Stu and I in the camera plane rendezvoused with the Strani over in the Gulf Islands. Jim, who flies for PWA, had to go back on a trip, so the rest of us sat around remembering how things used to be. The Strani's become a legend, really, in her own time, and the stories that seem to come flowing out go on and on, apparently forever. They used to call it the Seymour Sane Net. <laughs> <laughs> There's and, more names uh, for it, for goodness sakes, than we're scary passengers. It was called the Flying Meccano Set. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a friend of mine, who was a pilot for Air Canada now, his son, who was about four years old, said, Gosh, I'm glad my dad doesn't fly that thing. All held together with string. <laughs> Stroy Yates. Huey you can probably tell you more about this, but this airplane, uh, probably did more to open up the B.C. coast than any other airplane uh, in British Columbia. They used to take this airplane and leave Vancouver in the morning, and they'd go all the way up to Prince Rupert, and stopping at every place where there was someone to pick someone up. And they stopped at every kind of a logging camp, a uh, uh, little mining town where there was a general store, and they'd discharged freight and people, and it was a it was a, a jitney service. I think economically it was, they say that it's cheaper to run than a Norseman. Like 20 people, three of a crew, and a head out, you drop nine, pick up six, drop four, pick up 12. The sort of a deal. We used to run two of them. The one on the west coast of the island, one on the east coast. So one strand you'd go out on the west coast, and it would go over to uh, to Tofino, and then to uh, Tassis, Zabalas, CPC, Esperanza, and up into Shamus, and back. Then on the east coast, east coast of Vancouver, we'd go up, and the first landing would be Powell Lake, take the Powell River people. That was fun. Then we'd wander <laughs> on up, going into lots of funny little places, and we'd have up to uh, oh, 24 landings a day. It was a real jitney, a real bus service. Yeah. First one on the coast. We'd only dock once. We'd only dock at uh, Sullivan. Mm -hmm. We'd refuel there. Everything else was water taxi or uh, little Oops. boom cats or something coming out. A, beauti a beautiful hull, though. Yeah? Well, yeah. Well, you've, got, you've got to dig this hull. Uh, it takes the British to hydrodynamically to build a hull like this. If you see it out of the water, it is the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen in all your life. It's got a flare, it's, it's got a, an entry, it has a step that is unsurpassed as far as I'm concerned, as far as water work goes. Mm -hmm. I can remember Art Jung, uh, I think it's about the second or third trip I'd ever made for QCA, flying right seat. And I'd flown seaplanes for a number of years prior to this. And we, had, we were running up to Kitimat or someplace in that area with a load of pumps and hoses. Uh, for firefighting. And the whole cabin was filled full of pumps and hoses, Briggs and Stratton's about, you know, yay big. And the crew man was laying on top of all of these. About, <laughs> he had about this much room. You know, he was stuck right up on top of all of this cargo. And it was a, 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 a fantastic load that we had. We left Vancouver and the weather was pretty duff. And we started chugging up the coast and we went past the north end of the island, Alert Bay, Sullivan Bay. And we got just off Surf Inlet. And the weather went, came down to, you know, zilch, nothing. So we turned around, we came back down and tried to cut inside. And it was just outside of uh, Clem 2, what is that, Millbank Sound? Mm -hmm. Where the great Atlantic swells or, or Pacific swells are rolling in. And there's no protection or anything else. And again, we ran into it there. And Art Jung elected, uh, so I thought at that time to land downwind, it's blowing about five or 10 miles an hour, which doesn't help you at all in these great swells. And I sat beside him, expecting to have Briggs and Stratton's going by me this way, <laughs> these great pumps and hoses and everything else. I thought the whole works had come out of it. 
And I stopped there and went chung, 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 chung. Bang. It was in. And you couldn't have done it with any other machine. A cancel couldn't do it. Uh, our modern float airplanes couldn't do it. But the hull on that thing is beautiful. Uh, a little place on the west coast of Vancouver Island, CTC. <laughs> And there was a mission, and there was a hospital there, and they're lovely people, just tremendous people. But they used to get uh, mission people that come out from the prairies, and they come from Saskatchewan and Manitoba and places like this, so they've never seen a boat, you know? And I think the plow was a little bit tough in those days, you see, because... <laughs> but they always put one of these chaps in charge of the boat. And they never had anyone that had any boat experience, and we used to land in a very narrow passage, and they'd come out to get their mail and to load and discharge passengers. And they came out in this little boat that was a converted gill netter, a little cabin on it. And this was the most harrowing experience that I've ever had in flying. Because they come running towards you and then they throw it in reverse and then they throw it <laughs> forward and they throw it in reverse. And they come thumping against the airplane, and which truly proved the, the value and the strength of the airplane because it couldn't have withstood that any other way, the thumping of boats was, was praise the Lord and the whole bit. Bang! <laughs> Very <laughs> religious. You know, this old lady, God bless you, God bless you, everybody. <laughs> you bang it, she'd run into you again. You know, and, and they come see, back. Keep away, keep away, <laughs> I'll come to you. <laughs> Stop your engines, Stop your engines. Sometimes you want to take off again, you know, wait until they ran out of gas. Oh, dear. Lovely people, though. Well, Fantastic. A, a no claims bonus, too. When we were flying uh, seaplanes or boats, we used to get 50 cents an hour extra. As long as you didn't ding anything. If you dinged a float, then you lost your no 50 claims. cents an hour. Uh. This was our no claims bonus. The only time I ever lost them was when these boats used to come in. Punch a hole. They'd run at you. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> what was that tale um, you were telling me, Stu, about? Uh, going into a little spot, and there's also a, an Air Force Canto uh, trying to dock. Well, you, I think, was flying captain, and, and I was flying right seat, first officer. And we went into Alert Bay, and this great Canto was sitting there. Mind you, Huey has flown everything that PWA has and QCA had in those days, and uh, including Canto's. And Hugh whistled in with 16 people to unload and I think nine to, to get on board. And they made one pass at the dock. Huey whistled in. We docked up, tied, discharged all of our passengers, all of our freight, mail, baggage, the whole works, uh, embarked everyone that had to go and went back out again before they got their lines off their propellers. <laughs> they had nine people standing up along the wings, and they had four people in the blisters and three on the nose, and there was two of them swimming. I think we're there. <laughs> They're all shuttling around. But with, with, with heaving lines? And with 24 stops a day, uh, you know, you couldn't waste any time. It was thump, in you went, you dumped your load, out you went. We used to have a, we used to have a crew man. He was a real, he was a, a, a great one. We liked him, though, because he was a pickpocket. <laughs> uh, he, had, he had a skill that was unsurpassed. <laughs> and you couldn't trust him with anything that to do with flying or with the airplane or seamanship. But Mike had this fantastic facility. As they came forward, he'd take bottles out of the inside pocket, <laughs> out of their hip pockets, <laughs> and he'd mark them down. And he didn't know their names, but he'd say, the guy with the blue veins on his face. Well, it's a big feet. <laughs> and wearing cowboy boots. And he'd come in and he'd have a whole armload of bottles and jugs. And these people never knew they lost them. And he'd trudge in and he'd pile them all underneath the co-pilot seat. And then when he got out of the airplane, he'd hand them back. But you could, it was a, it was a lovely thing to see. Because in the back of the airplane, after we took off and everything, you see guys going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they never knew. He was, he was tremendous. Yeah, he was with him. There was one little hatch way up in the tail between the between the two vertical stabilizers and the right in the midst of the horizontal stabilizer and uh, apparently a story that goes around that is told by pilots is that the captains used to go and put the first officers into these into the driver's seats and they'd be driving along and they'd go back for a walk 
and they walk up through the tail, open the hatch, and they stand up. And this is a gun hatch. They stand up there, and they lean over the back of this hatch, and they can reach the elevators that make the airplane go up and down. And they reach over, and they slowly push down on them. <laughs> and the airplane will start going down, and the green first officer would be sitting in there, and he'd be trimming up like crazy. <laughs> and and it, it pushed on a little bit more, and it would go down, and he'd be trimming and holding back on the wheel, trimming it out, and holding back, and then they'd let go. <laughs> they go. They all gone. See? And then they sit there, and then they reach, the, and they could reach way, way back and pick up the elevators and do the same thing. And the next thing, it would start going up. And he'd be fighting against this whole thing. I mean, it was a fun airplane. It's really a fun airplane. Well, remember the one that I told you about? This one that was going out of Torbay, I guess. And they lost an engine. So they landed in the Atlantic. Really rough. So in order to keep the thing from sinking, they sent the crew out and they ripped the fabric off the lower wing so the waves could go right through mm -hmm. without uh, destroying the wing. So they uh, put out a mayday, distress. So the Americans sent out a Catalina. PBY, a yeah. Well, it was out the wheels, yeah. you know. And it landed alongside. And the survivors from the Catalina all got on board the... <laughs> <laughs> they did. They got on board the Stranraer. And the Coast Guard cutter towed the whole thing into Boston. It was called a 90-mile-an-hour airplane. This means that they took off at 90, they climbed at 90, they glided at 90, <laughs> they cruised at 90, they did everything at 90 miles an hour. Stalled at 90? Stalled at 90, the whole bag. <laughs> yeah, the whole bit. Isn't that wonderful? You flew it with Peggy, yeah. did you? Yeah, she was wide open, all the valves, as I tell you, they're all wide open, and we'd stop at Sullivan Bay, and the engineer would get up with a little squirt gun and spoil all the valves. <laughs> Do you know what, 300 feet, you could be flying at 300 feet, and this won't mean anything, you're a pilot, but it won't mean anything to people unless they really fly. 300 feet, downwind, chop all of the power, do a 180 degree turn, and dead stick it. No power at all landed on the water. With a full load, you can't do that with most airplanes. No. Do you know what the, on the front of this airplane, up on the bow, there are two bollards, two stacks of aluminum with little caps on them for winding ropes around. They're a seaman thing. They could only be built in an airplane by the British people. <laughs> That's right. And you can come in and land, and those bollards between an artificial horizon sort of a thing. And you flew by these bollards that stood up in front of you. And you could touch down in the most beautiful entry, the nicest landings, the most satisfying thing in the world. Really. Here is, here is Huey flying DC-7Cs right now, all over the world. But there's something satisfying with that old bird, isn't there? Oh, I think so. You know, it's still fabric, you know. It's still fabric. It's a fantastic hull. The whole hull is uh, pure aluminum. And it's anodized. It's anodized to aren't, boot. Aren't the fittings stainless, Andy? All of them. Yeah. All of the fittings. Yeah. There isn't a fitting on there that's no. not stainless steel. That's right. Just as good a shape now as it was the day it was built. What was that, uh, uh, you mentioned a minute ago, uh, a deal where you, uh, where you received um, a military escort when you were picked up on the radar? We used to come down the west coast and the interceptors from the states used to come up. Any time they'd see a, a radar blip, and apparently the old Strani used to throw a pretty good one with all the it wires. like a squadron. And, with all the junk. <laughs> and this, two jets came up and intercepted the thing. And they radioed back. They found this unidentifiable object, but apparently it was friendly. <laughs> <laughs> People don't believe it. It's a legend in its own time. We used to fly this west coast of Vancouver Island. Half the time we couldn't, you know, normally you couldn't go over the top. You'd go around the outside and past race rocks and up the west coast. And uh, this radar deal used to pick us up now and then. And then after a while, as Huey said, they, they started to recognize 
this airplane for what it was. It wasn't a Normada or anything else coming down the coast. It was one airplane. And they come whistling out, and after a while, the guys would go back, I guess, to the mess in Payne Field or McCord Field, and they'd say, you should see it. Two wings, two <laughs> engines, top wing 20 feet above the bottom wing, bottom wing on top of the airplane, no wheels, you know? <laughs> and so they come whistling out, and after a while they were fighting, you know, all the guys were saying, it's my turn, and now out they come. So we used to stooge down the west coast and be a 200-foot ceiling, you know, and uh, five miles, and all of a sudden out of the overcast, bang, and you'd look out, and there'd be a F-86 sitting there. And this was day after day. And then they started taking pictures, you know, and that kind of got to us a little bit because, you know. Better than having shooting at it. And they were in black and white, I'll bet. <laughs> so we got tired, and then they'd slow roll, and then they'd disappear into the overcast. And then his buddy, who was sitting up above, would come down to take a look. And you see him talk on the mic and laughing. And that really got to us because it wasn't a laughable matter. We were doing, <laughs> we were doing a pretty serious job. You know? So I kind of got tired of this. Maybe I can take and go back a little bit because I wound up in Toronto picking up a new beaver one time and I ran into two Americans. And we ended up one evening having a cocktail before dinner in the town and country. And this one fellow said, uh, you fly on the West Coast? And I said, yeah. And he said, you're from Vancouver? And I said, yes. He says, near Seattle? And I said, yes. He says, near McCord Feet? I said, yes. He said, I got a good friend there. He says, name's Buzz Williams. And Buzz Williams, he said, is a real hot rock. He can really fly. He said, he, he is very entertaining. He said, but an awful bloody liar. And I said, uh, what do you mean an awful liar? And he said, well, so happened, he said, he's, telling, he's ruining the relationship between Canada and the United States. He said, one day he tells me he's out flying. He, he said, they scramble. He goes out, he ends up over the ocean. He says, great big waves. And he says, he sees an airplane. He says, it's got two engines. It's got two wings. It's got two tails. He said, the bottom wing is sitting on top of the airplane. He said, the top wing is sitting, you know, 15 feet above that. He says, it must carry 50, 60 people. And he says, he flies down alongside of it and looks at it. And some guy stands up in the airplane. He said, mind you, got to understand Buzz Williams. He says, he's an awful bloody liar. Very entertaining, though. He says, as he's flying alongside, some guy holds up a sign. And he says, it's got four-letter words on it. And he said, uh, you know, he said, uh, this is kind of going to ruin your reputation out there flying on that West Coast. And he said, have you ever heard stories like this? So I reached into my wallet, and I pulled out a picture of the old Stranny. And I said, does this look like the airplane? He looked at it, and he said, my, you see you daddy fly that? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I didn't know. I, you know, I said, I used to fly it for a company that operated up and down the coast. And he said, is that right? And I said, yeah. I said, it didn't cruise at 200 miles an hour. It only cruises about 130 knots. Not only that, I said, the bottom wing and the top wing are only about 12 feet apart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not only that, I said the fellow that stood up and held out the sign, it didn't say what you said it said. It said another four-letter word. <laughs> Meaning, go away. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, my, my, that's very entertaining. <laughs> and this is what happened. They used to bounce us all the time and we'd... I got so tired of this that I printed a great sign on a Dixie cup box and it had a four letter word and, and I stood up, I put the seat belt, it's got a hatch, the two pilots in the airplane have hatches over top of the thing slide back and there's a great hatch in, in the forward section on the fore deck. It's more of a ship than an airplane really, but if you stand up on a, on a structural member that runs through the cockpit and slide the hatch back, and put a safety belt through your own belt, you can stand out about here, you know, and you're exposed. And so I stood up and I held this sign off, and the first side said, Boo! <laughs> you know, <laughs> big letters. And this, this F-86 F is staggering by the guest, and he's got his coop top back, he's got his dive brakes out, there's great black smoke roiling out of the back, and he's staggering, just 
to the point of stall, see? And then when I turned the sign over and it said what I said on the other side, he staggered off. <laughs> <laughs> The sign bit. There's only one thing I wanted to do besides putting the sign up after this. American Air Force bouncing us so many times. But I always wanted to come taxiing into a dock with a hammock slung between all of the struts. <laughs> and guys laying in the hammock with their hats back. <laughs> and I'm gonna do that one day. flying boat. We'll look for your company again next week at the same time. From Klahani, the great outdoors, good night.